Hello, and welcome to this eSchool News webcast. My name is Andrew Barber, and I'm a writer and editor here at eSchool News. And I'm going to be acting as the moderator today for a very special presentation where we hear from the 2015 winners of the Collaboration Nation video contest, which is sponsored by CDWG in partnership with eSchool News. Before we get started, I want to remind members of the audience that entries for this year's Collaboration Nation competition, the 2016 contest, can be submitted any time between February 1 and April 30. So be sure to get your video entries in for a chance to win the $50,000 grand prize or one of three $15,000 prizes awarded by CDWG. And if you want to learn more about the contest, and how to enter, simply go to the URL that's shown on the screen. All right. And for those of you who have not attended an eSchool News web webinar before, let me just quickly cover a couple of basics. First off, today's event will be recorded. So in a couple of days, you'll receive an email from us that has a link to the recorded event. And you'll also be able to download a PDF of the presentation from that same email. Uh, and then secondly, please ask questions. You know, don't feel as if you have to wait until the end. At any time during this presentation, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your console and hit the Submit button. I hope we'll have uh, 10 or maybe 15 minutes at the end when our speakers can answer your questions. Before we hear from our 2015 winners, though, I first want to introduce someone who has played a pivotal role in the education technology publishing market for more than 30 years. Wendy LaDuke serves as group publisher for eSchool News, eClassroom News, and eCampus News. And as much as anyone in education today, she understands the importance of collaboration when it comes to using technology to help student improve student learning. And I think that the Collaboration Nation contest is a reflection of that. Welcome, Wendy. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to everyone, and, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Um, I just wanted to take a moment uh, to kind of outline how this particular contest came about. Um, we've had conversations with our editorial teams um, over the years about the changes um, within the education community and how all of us, whether on the education side or on the industry side, find ourselves in a situation where we're constantly being asked to do more with less. Um, that kind of dictates that we need to look at different models of how we work and how we go to achieve mutual goals and targets that we have. And that is kind of how the conversation came to pass with uh, CDWG. Um, we all recognize that technology pay, plays a very important role in enabling a lot of things to happen in a much faster and more efficient manner. But the barrier um, in education, as we have seen through the years, has always come from the fact that we all seem to operate in silos. It is very challenging, as all of you know, to break down those silos, to reach across the aisle, and to work with other people within our schools and districts to leverage the strengths, the expertise um, that each of us have in different ways to be able to achieve a common and a mutual goal, which is really to improve learning for all of our students. So when we sat down with CDW, um, it was a natural conversation to figure out a way to help drive that process and that change in the model of how we work with one another. And CDW was gracious enough um, and had enough vision and foresight to understand that since we're talking about technology as a tool to enable those changes and those shifts in collaboration, that that should be the very motivation for schools and districts that are doing really amazing and innovative work um, to achieve the goals for all our students. So they were the partner um, that we could not have chosen better. Um, they've supported education for a number of years. They understand how things work, the pain points, um, the solutions that they've developed to be able to help move the ball up the field. And so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Liz White, who is the Senior Segment Marketing Manager for CDW. And she can explain to you um, the rest of the program and how it came to be and where we're going next. Liz? Thank you, Wendy. 
I'm very excited to share information about the program with you all today. We're delighted to partner again with eSchool News for our second annual Collaboration Nation program. As Wendy mentioned, this program brings innovation in ed tech to life. It's been amazing to see the types of projects that schools and districts are completing. And what we're seeing, it's just remarkable. So that's kind of where our prog program started initially. When eSchool News and CDWG started discussing what a program like this could be, we wanted something that would not only capture how technology is bringing innovation to the classrooms, but how that's changing learning. We also wanted to see how schools and districts were solving problems across their departments. And that really is the core of the collaboration portion. In conversations that we've been having with customers, we've heard the notion that bringing technology into the classroom isn't a simple thing. It's not as simple as putting a device in the hands of students. It really takes the expertise and knowledge and support from the instructional team, the teachers, the IT department, and the administration, just to name a few. We wanted to see firsthand what was involved in bringing a truly integrated project like that to life and what made it successful. So we asked schools and districts to demonstrate through a short video what it took to make their particular project tick. Everything from their education vision, the strategy, the challenges, the lessons they learned, and how they measured success. The end result was a great selection of videos that demonstrated all of that and more. It was fascinating to see the different projects and activities that schools and districts across the nation executed. In a lot of ways, it solidified what we at CDWG already know. It takes more than just technology, although that certainly helps, to make these projects successful. It takes foresight and planning, integration, and of course, collaboration. Because we anticipated many examples of EdTech collaboration, we decided to include multiple ways for schools to win. We have a grand prize and three monthly community choice winners. Since the education community is so driven by peer review and feedback, we wanted this program to follow suit. Each month during the duration of the contest, our Collaboration Nation community, which resides on Facebook, was asked to vote for its favorite video. The school or district with the most votes won $15,000 to spend with CDWG. I should say now that if you're not already following us on Facebook, please do so that you can learn more about the 2016 program. Aside from the three monthly community choice winners, we also selected a grand prize winner. This winner was chosen by a panel of four esteemed ed tech influencers and they completed a scoring rubric for every entry we received. Then they collectively determined the grand prize winner, and that school received $50,000 to spend with CDWG. You'll be hearing from our 2015 winner in just a couple of moments. Today we launch our 2016 Collaboration Nation program, and we're looking very forward to seeing what you all have to share with us. So please uh, take a moment to follow us on Facebook and to check out the page, and we look forward to hearing from you. Now back to you, Andrew. All right. Well, thank you, Liz. All right. Now it's time to hear from the uh, 2015 winners of the Collaboration Nation competition and the recipients of that $50,000 grand prize, the Napa County Office of Education. Now, last year's contest was very competitive, but the story of how Napa built a partnership of teachers, parents, officials, and organizations to implement a countywide pre-K literacy program really captured the imagination of the judges. So and here to tell that story about how they did it are four members of the Napa County team. Dr. Barbara Nemko has served four terms as the Napa County Superintendent of Schools and also serves on the California Superintendent Technology Task Force. And before coming to Napa, she worked at UC Davis for 12 years as project director and principal investigator for 11 California Department of Education research projects. And Lori Hill is the educational programs coordinator for the digital early learning program. And in this role, she brings together lots of different departments with the common goal of improving literacy skills among preschool children in Napa. 
And then our third speaker, Justin Hefley, is a senior systems analyst at the Napa County Office of Education. He's been with the NCOE for the past seven years, starting out as a desktop support specialist before taking on the role of network technician. He's been in his current post for a year. And then our final speaker is Jeanette Luders, who is an early childhood special education teacher, been teaching in a variety of preschool settings for 12 years. Jeanette is the lead digital early learning coach in Napa, helping preschool teachers use technology in their classrooms to promote their students' language and literacy skills. Welcome and congratulations to all of you on winning the Collaboration Nation Grand Prize. Barbara, why don't you get us started? Thank you, Andrew. We are so grateful to CDW for this wonderful honor. We started the program because we had a very big challenge in Napa County, and that is 80% of our preschool students come from English learner homes and high poverty homes. Those are two of the major risk factors that children bring to school in learning how to read. Because many of our students have a very limited vocabulary in English and most of them were not being read to at home, they bring to school what is now called by the research community the 30 million word gap. If you listen to the Clinton Foundation that has a wonderful program called Talk, Read, Sing to Your Baby, this is a nationwide issue and we're asking parents to do what typically happens naturally in middle class and professional families where we start talking to babies the minute they put the baby in our arms and we do what they call serve and return, we speak, and then we pause as though the five-hour-old infant was going to respond. This doesn't happen for all children. We can encourage parents to talk and sing to their babies, but if you don't read in either English or Spanish, that's something that no matter how much you would like to do, you're not able to do. So we wanted to have our children come to kindergarten on a more level playing field, where at the present time, the kids who come from the middle and professional families are about 18 months to two years ahead of the children who come from English learner families and poverty families. We wanted to do this for all children in Napa County. That's a pretty tall order because we have five different school districts in the county. And we wanted to ensure that children could be doing it in school and at home. So we knew this was going to require a tremendous amount of collaboration internally and externally. Internally, because it would require our IT department, our early childhood department, our curriculum department, as well as our administrative team. And externally, because if we were going to get to all the families, it was going to require family resource centers, as well as um, other external partners like Napa Learns that helps fund us, our P16 Council that works with schools, so lots of moving parts in this endeavor. I'm going to move to the next slide and show you how, oh, our next slide is the letter going to B. Yes, is that just the letter B? Our coach hey, Kenya, it's your turn. is going to share with you what she did in her classroom and then took on the road to help all of our teachers as a coach for this digital early literacy program. We found that digital was going to be the answer because it would be engaging. It would be interactive, and children could do it again and again, which would be like having their parents read a book to them again and again, and thus begin to make the correspondence between the written word and the word that they hear. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeanette Luders. 
Hi, what I'm going to show you next is, you got a, a sneak peek of it there, but I'm going to show you um, a video of um, what we did in the classroom. Um, I will um, give you a little background of my classroom. It's an inclusive program that has three and four-year-old children uh, with and without special needs, and they have limited English skills typically when they come into our classrooms. And I want to show you this video of how we added the digital piece into our curriculum. And this video was uh, first done a few years back, so we've updated our technology. So we have mirroring that shows the books to the children in a large group. Um, in this video, we have the preschool children on the floor. So I'll go ahead and show you the video. and. See if you can watch uh, for academic language being used uh, in the video. B, B. what letter? B, 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 B. The letter B. B. Yes, it starts with the letter B. Hey, Kenya, it's your turn. Ah, look, the little truck went forward. Forward. Mm -hmm. and, went, and now it went backwards. Mm -hmm, and then it went backward. Out in the cold, the great big truck will dump its load. Ah, what kind of truck is this called? Do you remember? A dump truck. A, A dump, dump truck. truck. Yes. All right. Tony's turn. Oop, again. Ah, it was dumping. And it goes away. And then it went away. You're right. And it go away. Mm -hmm. Ah. Hey, Cecilia, it's your turn again. Why is crash? You did. Is it full now or is it empty? Empty. Mm -hmm. It started out full and then it was empty. Sometimes mm -hmm. fast and sometimes slow. Blow by blow by hammering blow. Mm -hmm. What is this in his hand? Hammer. 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 Who used a hammer yesterday in the uh, the dramatic clay area? Mm -hmm. Yes, we use the hammer. Hey, Yair, now it's your turn to touch. You can do it, Yair. Mm-hmm, hammer. Pretend to hammer the floor, hammer. Hey. So this video we also show at our parent trainings and I asked the parents how many academic words they heard in the video. And another thing to note as looking at the video, there are children with and without special needs in the video and it's focusing on lots of different things, you know, turn taking, um, listening, and um, I throw in action into the books as well so it doesn't become just um, a sedentary activity. And that's one of the biggest things, you know, in getting our teachers on board is that it's just like reading any other literature that we have in the classroom. We make it fun. You know, it's not just, you know, sitting, um, you know, listening. Um, you know, we interact with the, the children and engage them. I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Barbara to talk about our community launch. We had identified that digital early literacy was the way to go. But as you know, you can be very excited about something, or as someone once said to me, I hate it when uh, people come home all excited from a conference that I didn't get to attend. So here we were, we had found this digital early literacy program program that we were using is something called Footsteps to Brilliance that made so much sense to us. It was a collection of stories, both fiction and nonfiction, that could be done in English or Spanish. You could toggle back and forth between them. It was colorful. It had music. It was animated. When the child touched the screen, as you saw in the video, they can make things happen. They could make the dump truck empty or get full. 
it could move forward and backward. The child could control it. So kids were really excited about it. It also had a phonics component. It had so many features that were very important to increasing children's preliteracy skills. And it could track how many words each child was exposed to, et cetera, et cetera. So the teacher could see that too. But now, how are we going to convince the parents, the public, the teachers, and everybody else that they should transform what they were doing in preschool education? It was rather a tall order. So we started by having a public launch. And we invited to that launch everybody who we thought might touch on families of preschool children. We invited the mayors of all five cities in the county, as well as city council members, board of supervisors, uh, head of housing, people in the family resource centers, our other partners. And in the picture, you can see the mayor at the microphone. That's the mayor of Napa. And the reason we invited all those people is because it doesn't matter whether you're an elected official or you're a family that works in the hospitality industry, we all have children and we all have grandchildren. So we wanted everyone in town to know about this. In order to make sure that we had a great launch, we invited Delane Easton, who was the former state superintendent of public instruction in California who has always been an advocate for early childhood education. And she gave a rousing speech about how this should be happening in every county in California, that we really need to be investing more in our preschool children. And as you can see, the audience was rather enthusiastic about what she had to say. So it's nice that we have all the people who don't actually have to do the work on board. The next part was how do we get the teachers and staff excited about this because they're the ones on the ground and they're the ones who we're asking to change their practices. Our preschool teachers, for the most part, have been with our office for many years. I've been with the county office for 25 years, and many of these teachers preceded me at the county office of education. There is an inherent uh, prejudice, I guess you would say, against digital devices and technology for preschool kids in the preschool community. Jeanette was one of our early adopters. She immediately saw the benefits and was excited about it. But not everybody was excited about it. And we didn't have these kinds of digital devices before 2010. So people had been teaching for years in preschool and there was no such thing as a digital device. Most of the research on technology and young children was done on television which of course is a very different medium than digital devices because television is not interactive. So we brought all of our teachers together and our staff together and we showed them some of the research about what would be the result if we got into digital early literacy. And we showed them what it would be like to use these devices. We gave each teacher a device. And we said, this was probably in uh, the spring of the year, we said, we're not expecting you to use this in your classrooms yet. We are giving you this device so that you can learn how to be comfortable with it. We will have our IT folks provide lots of professional development. We'll teach you how to use it. We will put the program that we want to use, Footsteps to Brilliance, on the device so that you can play with it at home over the summer, in the evening, whenever you like. If you'd like to try it out in your classrooms right now, that's fine, but we're not requiring it. In the fall is when we will expect everyone to be trying it out in classrooms. And by acknowledging some of their concerns and their fears with using these sorts of devices, we were able to overcome some of the resistance, but definitely not all. 
Other groups that we needed to get on board included, of course, the IT and the curriculum department, and we realized that we were reaching out pretty widely and broadly, and somebody was going to need to manage this program. We were going to be doing parent workshops and all kinds of things. So that's where we took Lori from our curriculum department and asked her to manage the program. So I'm going to turn it over to Lori to explain all the things that she did. Thank you, Barbara. As you've heard already, this um, is a countywide initiative, and it's quite an ambitious endeavor that we decided to take on. Um, and it requires a high level of coordination. There are many, many different departments and agencies and personnel involved in trying to pull this all together and make it happen. Um, we started with our implementing it, as Barbara said, in our 23 state preschool classrooms, which of course uh, our teachers needed training on how to use the program in the most effective way. And we also did quite a bit of, and, and are still doing quite a bit of training with the parents of the kids in the preschool classrooms. So having all this to organize, you can see the chart there. It was, oops, uh, um, just a little example of, of some of the coordination involved. Um, the shaded portions on the chart were uh, our, our parent literacy programs that we that we did, our trainings, and then some of the non-shaded uh, items are things that we did out in the community. And what we found was we also wanted to, having it be a, a countywide initiative, we needed to get out in the community and let them know about it. And the question was, how do we do that? This is a free app. It's, it's a really great program, um, such a rich program, available in English and Spanish, and we wanted to let people know about it. So one of the things that we did um, initially, we started holding trainings at our county libraries, and um, we found that they weren't well attended. So we decided in order to get the word out there, we needed to go where the people were already gathering. So we went out into the community, and to many of the community events, we still go quite often. Uh, this one here is Cesar Chavez Day. There were thousands of people uh, milling around different booths, and we set up our our devices and had flyers out explaining what the program's all about, the fact that it's free. Um, so we just really try hard to get the word out there. Another component of our program is that we're doing a five-year evaluation study. And so that's a big part of it. Um, we have, we're working with an evaluator. He's working very hard to um, come up with a, a, an implementation tool that so that we can judge the or, or look at the progress of our teachers and how well they're implementing the program. Uh, there, we also do, uh, like I said, a number of, of classroom teacher um, workshops and parent workshops. This is a parent literacy workshop on the left there that we actually have a translator there to um, translate the, the training into English and Spanish. Another event we went to was a, um, a local event in St. Helena. Um, it has required a lot of coordination with our early childhood education staff, the site supervisors there, the administrators, the teachers, our IT staff has provided a, a great deal of training and support with our su getting our supplies together, setting up, checking out the Wi-Fi, and then again, of course, with our evaluator. Um, we've worked closely also with our promotions department and also with the Footsteps to Brilliance team. They've been really, really great at helping us provide promotional materials that we need to get the word out in, in the community. We've partnered with a number of different organizations, um, uh, Olay Health and uh, Up Valley Family Centers to help provide uh, a venue for us to, to have our literature out there for people to learn about the program. And we have our IT person, Justin, who's been really instrumental in helping us put this, pull this all together from a technology standpoint. So Justin's going to tell you exactly what he's been up to. Thank you, Lori. Um, so as an IT standpoint, uh, we started off, uh, Dr. Nemko came to us and asked us if it would be possible. So our first uh, priority was to 
make sure that each preschool site uh, for trainings or even uh, the community trainings, we needed to make sure their Wi-Fi could handle up to, I think our main goal was 20 devices at each site. Uh, the classrooms themselves were very far behind uh, with this equipment, so we had to make sure that everything was updated and ready for when we did implement uh, all the devices into the classrooms, that it could handle on a daily basis uh, about five to 10 devices per site. Uh, we also need to make sure that the tablets operating systems were fully up to date. Uh, we made sure that the applications that the teachers were using were up to date. Uh, we also provided <clears throat> support, just random IT support for the trainings, parent trainings and community trainings uh, in the capacity where we would set up the equipment and then sit with the parents and help them create free email accounts, uh, install the app, and get signed in, and just basic features of the Footsteps of Brilliance app. Uh, and we've, we even came up with a, a full update schedule on all of the teacher devices and student devices that are deployed in all of the preschools. I think there's 100 and 110 devices that we have on a, a rotating schedule to make sure that everything is up to date. Back to you, Barbara. I want to clarify one thing. The program that we're using is free to every family in Napa County. It is not a totally free program, and we were able to provide this again because we collaborated with Napa Learns, which is an organization that has been formed for the purpose of furthering education in the county. They raise money for us. So they saw the value in this and were able to give us enough money that we went 50-50 and now we have a site license in perpetuity for the families in the county. We needed to have someone who could explain the program, who knew it better than we did, because this program has lots of moving parts. It's got teacher resources and handouts and lesson plans and all kinds of things. So the folks who created the program came to Napa and worked with our teachers to show them not everything at one time, but sort of on a need-to-know basis, this is how, what you need to know to get started after you've done this. We came back and provided additional training. And that was very helpful. But all of us who have been teachers or currently are teachers know that you go to a training, particularly when it involves technology, and everything works beautifully. And you walk out of there and you think, oh, this is great. I can't wait to try it in my classroom. And then you get into your classroom and whoops, something goes awry and you're not quite sure what to do. So we had taken care of the first problem, which was making sure that the underlying infrastructure was sufficient. Because if I'm a classroom teacher and I try something and I keep getting the, the little swirl of death that says it's doing whatever it's doing, but it's not giving me the program that I'm looking for, I'm not going to go back and, and keep trying this because I've got 20 kids sitting in front of me who are getting very restless while the program is trying to load. So that had been taken care of. But in terms of using it in the classroom, it's different to have someone up front when I'm at a training than it is using it in my classroom. That's when we realized we needed to have coaches who could go directly into a classroom with the teacher, observe the teacher, demonstrate for the teacher, and provide that one-to-one -one real-time coaching. Jeanette was our go-to girl and still is. So as you see here, we have the um, 
coaching format. So what I've done, as Barbara mentioned, is going into the classrooms and providing support, being in their classroom, helping them with things if it doesn't work, showing them how to use it, helping them get the children engaged. And so we developed the coaching model um, where the teachers will figure out what their current reality is, and then we develop a SMART goal. So it's specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, and just target strategies and techniques, and then um, you know what their evidence is that they've uh, met that goal. And so I go into the classrooms um, at least twice a month um, with children, so I'm helping them you know, while the children are there, and then I meet with the teachers once a month without children. So that's the biggest challenge is um, initially when I was going into the classrooms, you know, and trying to talk to the teachers as they're teaching, you know, is not a very good um, structure. It wasn't working very well. So thankfully, we figured out with administration to have time for the teachers to meet with uh, the coaches without children so we can really brainstorm how they can use it in their curriculum and how they can um, adapt activities to um, meet the needs of the children. Um, so the next slide um, is what we all developed, um, just the same as um, figuring out expectations. You know, different people, whether it be administration or coaches, going into the classrooms, trying to figure out what the exact um, expectations are of using digital literacy in the classroom. And so all of us worked together um, and developed implementation strategies, um, as you see in this slide. And then we also did um, a training video to talk, um, to really show the teachers in action, um, there's lots of teachers that were, you know, took hold of it and were using it appropriately um, in their classrooms. And so we went in um, and did a videos to provide uh, the other teachers with more hands-on approach. And I'll let Lori talk more about that. We had several teachers that jumped right in and um, found ways where they could use this pro program effectively in the cl classroom, and we wanted to use their ideas and their enthusiasm to help motivate the other teachers. So we went in the classrooms and videotaped them using it, and we used that as part of the teacher training uh, at the beginning of the school year this year, and showed the videotapes of them in the classroom, and then we had the teachers take portions of the implementation tool that we had developed that was on just the last slide, and we had them uh, look for the items in that implementation tool that they could see in the video. And so the impl implementation tool is sort of a guide for them to show them these are the things we're looking for when you use the Footsteps of Brilliance program. And having them have that visual of seeing teachers using it and, and doing it well and seeing them in action really, really helped to motivate them, I think, and got them uh, thinking, you know, how can I use this in my classroom? How can I adapt it for how I want to use it in the classroom. We, didn't, we don't have a scripted way necessarily for them to use them. There are just certain things, we, goals we like them to achieve. Um, but they can use their own creativity and come up with you know, different kinds of ways to use it and, and extension materials and activities for the kids that go along with the books in the program. So that was a very effective way of getting some of the teachers that maybe were a little hesitant and not so, maybe not a little more unsure about using the program. Uh, that, that was very helpful in getting them on board. So again, this is a, a county-wide, community-wide initiative, and we worked very closely with our promotions department and with the Footsteps to Brilliance folks to develop some materials that we could get out into the community. Uh, the flyer you see there is a very eye-catching flyer. It's 8.5 by 11. We also had some poster sizes made, and the Footsteps folks helped us with that. It, it's really simple. It has a brief explanation of how the program works and what it's all about. And then at the bottom of the page, there's a link where, where um, preschool age parents can go and register their kids and be able to get the, the uh, program for free. They just download the app, which is free, onto any of their mobile devices. And then they register themselves and their child, and they're sent an email with their login information so they can begin using it right away. Um, we also had a, uh, we've got parent literacy workshops that we did quite a bit of uh, out in the community and also in the classrooms that, uh, where the kids were already using it. 
And then again, we participated in many, many community events and we continue to do that. Uh, the flyers we've sent uh, all over the county. We post them in coffee shops and laundromats and libraries and places where we think people will be gathering and might be interested in the information. So uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the video that just shows a little bit about um, what we, we have done out in the community. Y así usando las palabras de la luna llena, mira que hay animales, una casita, ¿ok? Y ahora vamos a ver los animales creeping, ¿ok? Sienta bien así los animales. Y así está. We've partnered with a number of different organizations that have helped us also spread the word. Uh, we've worked with Napa Valley Community Housing and gone out to their housing sites, several of them out in the community for uh, low-income folks, and done presentations and showed them how to use the Footsteps program. And our goal when we go out to these events is to have them leave with the app downloaded on their device and with their logins um, on their, in their email and have them ready to go and it's been uh, very effective. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. We've also partnered with the Napa Moms Club. It's a club for preschool uh, parents, preschool age parents, and they have over 300 members, so we go to their events every year. Uh, Parent University has helped us quite a bit um, in some of our presentations, and Olay Health is another organization in the community that is using it in their, in their waiting rooms for the kids to be able to use the program while they're waiting. Um, another strategy that we used um, to help promote it was we developed a really quick little ad that, we're, um, that we've had out in, in the movie theaters. So this ad played for two different theaters for a month at each theater, and it was shown before every movie that played at the theater for that month. And again, it's just another way for us to try and make people aware of this fantastic free resource that will help their kids to increase their vocabulary. So here's a little clip of our movie theater ad. Prepare your child for kindergarten with Footsteps to Brilliance eBooks and Games. This fun learning program is free and available in English and Spanish. Go to NapaCOE.org and start learning today. Footsteps to Brilliance, big brains for little people. As you've heard, we had lots and lots of community partnerships, and that was critical on so many levels in terms of publicity, in terms of uh, financing. One group that hasn't been mentioned are the Napa Valley Vintners, who also saw the value in this and have helped us as well they have invested in a, an early learning strategic initiative. Uh, of course, the research from economist James Heckman says that for every dollar that we invest in good quality preschool, we get $7 back and a variety of other uh, social goods that come from kids who've had this advantage when they are in preschool. So, you also probably want to know, how do we know if this is successful? We've been working very hard on developing a variety of measures. The ultimate measure will be if children 
are using this program in preschool, when they get to third grade, are they proficient readers? That's a longitudinal study that we are involved in right now. But because we don't give standardized tests till the end of third grade, there are a number of years that we have to wait until we can get those results. We have done lots of preliminary testing. So we've used Peabody Picture Vocabulary testing pre and post and have gotten statistically significant results in both expressive and receptive language. And in addition, the English learners made the greatest gains. In fact, they even outscored the native English speakers in some categories. They have also done amazingly well in letter recognition before they get to kindergarten. Uh, and they have read more using this particular app than compared to a control group. So our early results are really positive. We also, on the California English Language Development Test called the CELT test, saw that the kids who tested when they first got to kindergarten, the ones who had not used the program, they were scoring lower than a control group but after using the program in kindergarten, they outscored the control group in first and second grade. So those are pretty good preliminary results. But again, bottom line is going to be how are they doing at the end of third grade. So it looks like we're ready for some questions and answers. All right. Well, thank you so much, Barbara, and thanks to everyone on the Napa County uh, team for for explaining to us how you took on what is really a very, very large and far-reaching program throughout the county. Uh, it, I mean, it's extremely impressive, and I can certainly see why you won the, won the contest. Um, we do have about uh, 14, 13, 14 minutes left uh, before the hour is up. So. Let us, um, we'll turn to some questions in a minute. Uh, but for those of you who have questions about the two, 2016 competition, the one that starts on February 1, uh, if you have questions about that, please just go to the uh, URL that you see on that, on, at the bottom of the Q&A screen, eschoolnews.com slash collaboration uh, for full uh, and slash rules for, the whole, for all the information you need to enter the, uh, enter the contest. So let's uh, turn right now to some of the questions. Uh, Barbara, you you'd mentioned how I mean you you really reached out to an incredibly wide range of county leaders, organizations, and parents. And you know all of these people have are extremely busy, and they get approached a lot by a lot of people asking for their support. How did you sort of how did you break through? Uh, the cluster, and how did you succeed in getting traction where others often fail? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, happy to. I think the nicest thing about this program is when you see it in action, it sells itself. Number one, we weren't asking any of these community leaders for anything except their a little bit of time and attention, and if they thought it was great to tell other people about it and make sure that the parents that they came in contact with knew that this was available to them. We invited as many people as we could to come into classrooms to watch the children. And interestingly, when we first started the program in a very small pilot, a four-week, they call it preschool boot camp in the summer of 2011, the kindergarten teachers at the school where this preschool boot camp was going on were appalled at the idea that we were coming in with a digital literacy program. They thought this was a terrible idea. And the lead teacher, actually came in on her own time over this four-week period in the summer to look at the program so she could tell everybody how stupid it was. And by the end of day two, I considered buying her pom-poms because she had become a cheerleader for the program. When she saw how engaged the children were, 
she had lots of experience as a preschool, as a kindergarten teacher, where these kids would come in and didn't speak for weeks because they didn't speak English and they were not comfortable. And she saw these kids, preschool kids, who were talking right away. They were talking to each other. They were helping each other with the technology. They were laughing at the stories. They wanted to read the stories because they loved being able to touch the screen and make things happen. So we thought if we can convince kindergarten teachers who came in with a tremendous bias against the program, all we have to do is show people. So we invite people whenever we can to come in and take a look at the program and that's how we develop traction, and that's how we develop a lot of people who are supporters. Yeah, terrific. Well, thank you very much. And just to follow up on that, uh, you, know, you, you talked about the experience of having children in preschool seeing this and use it. And now, as I understand it, the, the Footsteps to Brilliance program that you're using is a, a county-wide license that, uh, that parents whose children are not even in the in, in a preschool or in in a, in a formal environment can access and can use at home, um, and it's much harder to reach those parents who aren't in, aren't coming into the school. What are some of the strategies you use to uh, besides the, I saw the movie video obviously besides that what other strategies did you use to to get the word out to people who aren't, weren't actually involved with the schools yet? Well, as Lori said, we put posters and information in places that these families are likely to be at, for example, in laundromats, in doctor's offices, in uh, Clinic Olay, or Olay Health it's now called, sorry, but places that they're spending time, and everything, of course, was in English and Spanish. She goes to events where families come. It could be a Chamber of Commerce picnic, and we have a booth, and we hand out information to the parents that has the link so that they can log on. And when we do events, sometimes we do events at, the, at a preschool site, but we ask the elementary school located, sometimes the preschool is in the elementary school or the elementary school is nearby, to send information out to all of their families that we're going to be doing this event for preschool families because a lot of the preschool kids have older siblings. So we get them to come to our preschool site even though they don't have a child in the preschool. The, the video that we did that showed in movie theaters was another way of getting the word out and family resource centers and parent universities. So all of those help us to reach parents who may not have kids in preschool, but may have children in some other level of education. That's how we can tap into them. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you for, for explaining that a little further. Uh, the next question, I think, I think it might be best to handle by Jeanette. Uh, during the presentation, there was a reference to uh, the coaching model and uh, reference to SMART goals. And one of the audience members wants to know if you could share a SMART goal example for the coaching model. Sure. Uh, one of, there's actually quite a few, just depending upon the level of the teacher. Um, for an example, a current reality for some teachers may have been just navigating the app and using the device successfully. Um, and so that was their goal, you know, just to be able to use the device to, you know, read the books, figure out how to, you know, find their way in the program. Um, there's games and such in the program that um, reinforces the vocabulary that are in the books. So helping the teacher know how to do those things. Because uh, quite often what happened is the preschool children may be able to navigate it more quickly than the teacher. And so the teacher wanted to, um, you know, be on top and um, understand how to navigate the program. Um, another one may be um, they're already using the program successfully, they're reading the stories, and so their SMART goal may have been that they want to figure out how to provide extension activities. And so we would provide, um, we did a resource binder where we um, put all the different books that um, were, being, were available to be read, um, and then helps with extension activities. Um, and we work with Lori's department in building um, off-screen activities to help with um, using the vocabulary in all activities within the, within the classroom. Thank you. All right, uh, Barbara, I'm going to come back to you. Um, you, you, as, you as you mentioned in your presentation, the, the program is, is free to 
uh, you know, parents and children within the community, but it was not free to uh, Napa County. And so before you, you know, paid for the program and, and, and invested in the program, um, did you go out and get buy-in from all the people who are going to have to help you implement this before you signed on the dotted line or, or, or after? I mean, can, can you talk a bit about the sort of the chicken and egg here of what came first, how you went through getting that buy-in before you committed and what you did after? Absolutely. The first, our first foray into the program was this small pilot summer boot camp. We introduced the program to one of our Napa Learns founders. He looked at the program and thought it was pretty exciting and pretty different than what typically happens in preschool. He went to the superintendent of one of our districts and said, I will pay 50% or Napa Learns will pay 50% of the cost of running this program in the summer boot camp as a pilot. So again, seeing was very motivating. When we ran this pilot, we invited lots of people to come and see it, and everybody who saw it got excited. Probably the funniest thing that happened to us was at the end of that four-week pilot that I described earlier, we had a debrief with everybody who was involved with it, some of the funders and all the kindergarten teachers and the teacher who taught the summer pilot and the superintendent and, and people from our office. And our plan had been for the 16 kids who'd been in this boot camp, each of whom had been given an iPad, they were going to take it to their kindergartens. And we would, there were four kindergarten classes. So each class would have four devices that they could use as a digital center. The kindergarten teachers, the four kindergarten teachers who had hated this program before they actually saw it, came to the debrief and said, excuse us. What do you mean we're only going to have four devices per classroom? We want every child to have a device. So the funders were there with us, and they said, okay, we'll help. And that was how we were able to get the program started in four kindergarten classes in our first full year of implementation. Okay. All right, terrific. Answer? Well, that yeah, – no, absolutely. I mean, so – you know, you, you've been involved with education for, for many years. Uh, it, it, you know, with Footsteps of Brilliance, this pilot project obviously worked very, very well. Would you generally recommend pilot projects as a key component of, of getting buy-in and sort of kick-starting the whole collaborative process? Absolutely. It would be very foolish to put down money for a program just because it sounds good. You've got to see how it works in your area with your kids, with your parents, and your teachers. And then you, if it works, you invite everybody you know to come take a look at it because everybody is a partner. I think the biggest thing that was helpful was within our own organization. This is something that I never could have done alone. This could not possibly have happened without the collaboration of all the departments and all the wonderful people that put in extra time and extra work. The, I have to say the IT department has been magnificent because they had a very heavy burden of what we were asking them to do. Not only did they have to check out the infrastructure and improve it at the individual class level, but they also had to download the program on all these different devices. And as we refresh devices, because it's now been four years, then they have to start all over again. They have to collect the old devices and clean them, and then we donate them. We let parents use those and at home, and the kids get the new devices in class. Uh, another piece of this, a program that can be used on any device is really important because most families today, even low-income families, do have a smart device. And another piece of the partnership that we forgot to mention was we, would, we had a rent-to-own program for Kindles for Kids where a parent could put down 10 or $20 
take home the Kindle with the program on it and then pay $10 a month and own it at the end of the year. So another partnership that we had with Napa Learns to make this more accessible for everybody. But the administrative team had to all buy into it because you have different managers in different areas of our office, so early childhood, IT, curriculum, and administration all had to be fully on board or it couldn't have happened. Well, terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, and that, I'm afraid, is all the time that we have left for today. So as we wrap up, I, I really want to thank Barbara and your team from Napa County for, I mean, really a, a very inspiring story. Um, and I'd also like to thank CDWG for its support of the Collaboration Nation contest. And please remember that the, the 2016 contest kicks off on February 1. So uh, get your video application in any time until April 30th for a chance at the $50,000 grand prize or one of the three $15,000 prizes that CDWG is awarding. And one final reminder, we will be sending out an email to all the attendees when the recording of the webinar is ready. Um, so thank you, and this concludes today's webcast. Goodbye.